Beijing is investing billions of dollars in the continent and it's been Africa's biggest trade partner since 2009. And as I met Idris mentioned, security will also be high on the summit's agenda. The U.S. is concerned about groups ranging from Boko Haram in West Africa to Al-Shabaab and the continent's east. To highlight the meeting's focus on the next generation, President Obama met with a group of young Africans a few days ago. More than 500 young people from across sub-Saharan Africa had just wrapped up a six-week leadership fellowship in Washington, D.C. For more on the summit, let's bring in Kate Almquist, director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C. And also from D.C., we have Amadou Sai, a senior fellow at the Brookings Africa Growth Initiative. We appreciate both of them joining us tonight. Now, Amadou, I'm going to start with you. Uh, both of our correspondents kind of touched on some of the reasons, but I want your take on why is this summit just now happening? Why now? Well, uh, this is a good question. Um, President Obama, during his first term, uh, had to deal with the worst financial crisis uh, since the uh, Depression here in the U.S. And now it's his second and final term. Uh, now is the window of opportunity to do uh, something for Africa. Uh, so you're saying that he just had other priorities, so maybe that's why. Um, Kate, why do you think it's, it's finally happening? Is it overdue? Uh, I, th I think it's a recognition of the growing importance of Africa to the United States, uh, the fact that there are over a billion people on the continent of Africa and uh, population growth there is likely to quadruple uh, over the next uh, decades, uh, certainly by 2100. Uh, and so it represents an increasingly important area for us economically, for security reasons, uh, and uh, uh, for uh, transnational and global issues and challenges that uh, the U.S. Is, is very concerned with around the world. So um, it's an important uh, step in, in the process of uh, continuing and maintaining and improving relations with the 54 countries on the continent of Africa and uh, I, I think uh, it's a, a welcome signal from the Obama administration of you know, just uh, how important uh, this part of the world is uh, to the United States. And maybe he's just paying attention to the numbers as well. Let's go ahead and break down some of the numbers. Um, the GDP of sub-Saharan Africa grew quite a bit, uh, much more than the rest of the world over the past decade. So let's look at some of the numbers. U.S. Good, uh, goods exports to sub-Saharan Africa in 2012 was $1.5 billion dollars that increased by almost seven percent the following year to 24 billion dollars that is um let me do the math that's a 250 percent increase from 2003 and u.s goods imports were at nearly 50 billion dollars in 2012 that decreased by nearly 21 percent in 2012 um, the total was up 53% from 2003. Amadou, what is driving this? Well, um, there, is, there are a number of issues here. One is, uh, you know, Africa is growing fast, uh, as the figures uh, show. Uh, number two is that Africa is also uh, having a much uh, a young population, which is also growing fast. And Africa is having a middle class, which is expanding. So traditionally, the U.S. is involved in Africa in a very focused way. It's in Africa, in Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, and Mauritius, and it's mostly in Africa for the oil and gas. But recently, uh, with the middle class growing very fast, you see that uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of potential into uh, uh, information technology and communication sector, um, into the retail sector. You know, Walmart is in Africa now. Uh, uh, Microsoft Walmart is, is in, in Africa. Africa. That's fascinating. <laughs> yes, uh, GE now makes more uh, revenues outside the U.S. than in the U.S and is also in Africa. And let's take one very interesting uh, example that I like very much. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University has a master's program in Kigali in Rwanda. And that's, uh, that's a place, that's a, that's a segment where, for example, the U.S. has a clear comparative advantage compared to China or other uh, countries. Um, Kate, let me ask you about this. When you hear about some of these huge American companies that see opportunities in Africa, how alert must people be about not companies, companies not simply exploiting Africa? Well, I think American companies are very attuned to uh, some of the challenges inherent in uh, operating in certain parts of Africa and then also the opportunities of uh, being able to um, tap into this uh, growing middle class that Amadou just mentioned, as well as the uh, tremendous uh, uh, resources that, that Africa offers uh, to the world. 
So I, I think that uh, we have a, a variety of um, interests and possibilities for our engagement in Africa. And, and it's, it's far more interesting than um, just natural resources. It's this uh, expanding middle class that uh, is a market that we can't afford to ignore you know, for our own economy's sake going forward. So um, it's a very important place for us to be. And you talk about the middle class because sometimes when you hear about countries um, who, who are, are doing better um, or getting wealthier, sometimes that may be a case of the rich getting richer um, and, and sometimes they're, they're not creating a middle class. Amadou, um, what do you see happening here? Is there really a sturdy middle class that's being built? Yeah, so economists do not agree on the definition of a middle class. Some mm -hmm. say when you spend $2 or more a day, you're part of the middle class. Others say that it's $20 or more. But definitely uh, Africa's middle class is growing, has grown, and is attracting uh, foreign investment. Now, I think the key issue here is how to make this growth sustainable and how to make it inclusive. And, you know, Africa, Africa's population is very young and it's growing very fast. It's becoming urbanized. So the key issue here is, will we be able in Africa to create the jobs of the future? And will we be able to employ all these youth? That's why there's this term, the demographic dividend, which is floating around. And it's, it, it just shows the potential that Africa has. But we have, to, we have a window of opportunity now, and we, we have to seize that opportunity, really. Let's talk about the issues of, of governance. Over the last decades, um, many countries have had democratic um, elections, um, have, have overthrown dic di uh, dictators, but there's also issues of corruption, let's just be honest. Issues of corruption, issues of governance. There's a lot of countries that don't function as they should. And we had discussion yesterday with a lot of medical professionals and talking about Ebola. And they said that Ebola would be contained in other countries and other continents, but it's not contained in place like Africa because there are some countries that just don't function quite the way they should. Are there issues like that that can actually hold Africa back when it's on the verge of actually exploding in such a positive way, Kate? Well, I think it's important when we're um, talking about Africa to recognize that there is a lot of diversity and sure. complexity across sure. uh, uh, the, the countries right, that we're, because I, we're I, referencing here. And you're here. right. I, sh I was talking about Sierra Leone. You're right. I should be more yes. specific about what I'm talking about. You're right. And, and so in some of the, the cases, uh, particularly in some of the countries in West Africa that are affected by uh, the Ebola outbreak that uh, is happening right now, uh, we are seeing weak institutions and weak capacity to, to deal with a public health challenge that you know, other countries in Africa and other parts of the world, certainly uh, our own country has uh, far different systems you know, and more developed systems to be able to deal with a, a, a situation like that. And I think that uh, does speak to the heart of um, so many of the challenges, whether we're talking security or development in Africa, and, and that is governance and institutions and, and uh, the ability of states and, and societies to you know, relate to each other and to work together to, um, to resolve issues, to handle stresses that come up, whether internal stresses or external stresses, you know, and uh, to be able to resolve um, uh, competition essentially non-violently and productively in a way that is, is inclusive and you know, fair for all citizens in a country. You know, and where we see a lack of um, the institutional capacity and the norms and the values to be able to go along with that, you know, then you know, these internal and external stresses, whether it's a, a public health crisis like Ebola or a transnational threat like uh, terrorism or violent extremism. Or Boko Haram or, or such. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's just it's, a, it's so much harder to, to deal with, and, and we end up treating the symptoms of those uh, things rather than looking at the underlying governance challenge that you're rightly pointing out. And I'm going to only actually ask you something. Do you find that sometimes people do what I just unfortunately did? Sometimes people maybe paint Africa with one broad brush when it's actually so much more diverse than that. No, it's true. Um, actually, uh, for many, uh, uh, Africa is a country. And um, that can uh, create problems, especially when there, uh, there, there, are, there is um, like uh, bad news when it comes to Africa. But I think, uh, you know, here one should not even underestimate the role uh, of the media, uh, the role even of, of you know, some cultural um, uh, uh, elements. Uh, so, but that's why I think um, it's a very uh, timely uh, event 
to have the U.S. Africa summits here, even if the summit, one of uh, the outcome of the summit is just to make the Americans more familiar with the diversity and the energy, the vibrancy of Africa, that will be uh, one good benefit. Absolutely. You know, some analysts see this summit as a direct response to China's decade-long surge in investment and, and trade in Africa. Actually, my colleague, Patricia Sopka, she talked with a professor, uh, Deborah Brodgum, and she's the director of the International Development Program and the China-Africa Research Initiative at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. This is what she had to say. Let's listen, and we can pick it up on the other side. Over the past decade, Chinese trade and Chinese investment in Africa has skyrocketed. Right now, for example, uh, in 2013, Chinese trade was at $220 billion with the continent, and the United States was $85 billion. So they're more than double, getting on to triple our amount of trade. And it's not just uh, imports of oil from Africa, it's exports of Chinese goods and services. And this is where the United States wants to catch up. So just a quick programming note, you can see more of Patricia's um, interview with the professor on real money with Ali Velshi uh, this Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, Amadou, do you think that uh, Professor, uh, President Obama, rather, who used to be a professor, um, is going to have to deal with some of the African leaders who are going to say, you know what, this is what China's done for us. You're a little late. <laughs> No, well, I disagree a little bit. When it comes to trade, it's true that now China is the largest bilateral trade partner um, of Africa. But when it comes to investment, the U.S. Uh, and together with France have the largest stock of foreign direct investment in Africa. The problem is that, that all that investment goes to very few countries, Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, in very few sectors. It's mostly the oil sector. So I think the issue now is really to open up right, uh, other businesses, other sectors uh, to, to, to um, the uh, U.S. private sector. And as I said, we've seen in the retail sector, we've seen the Walmarts going and competing with chains like Carrefour, which is from uh, Europe. We've seen uh, in the new technology, Microsoft, uh, you know, um, uh, IBM and so on are also in Africa. So I think really the challenge now is to diversify uh, and increase um, uh, U.S. investment in Africa. And I have to add, the Africans themselves have, ha have a few number of priorities, like uh, infrastructure, like electricity. So Power Africa, for example, which is a flagship project uh, of uh, President Obama, really addresses this issue of increasing uh, uh, power uh, access and uh, uh, generation in Africa. Uh, uh, Kate, do you agree with what Amadou is saying, that there's still so much more opportunity in Africa? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's an incredible space for American businesses uh, to diversify, as Amadou said, and to expand uh, beyond just na uh, natural resources and some of the key uh, uh, oil economies that we've uh, invested a lot in already. And I think, uh, as well, there's tremendous potential for um, African economies to trade with the, uh, within Africa and uh, across Africa. And, and that's uh, another very important aspect of uh, African economic growth and where U.S. investment uh, can be incredibly helpful uh, as with uh, the power initiative and, and other uh, infrastructure you know, investments that can help unlock uh, trade uh, within the continent as well, which will be very important for producing the jobs uh, to employ all the youth uh, that uh, we, we can see coming in the demographic youth bulge for, for African countries. And, and how important, how significant should, should human rights be uh, in this discussion as well. I realize that this is mostly a summit about about business, about um, the partnership that America and Africa um, can have, but what discussion should civil rights, should human, human rights have at the table as well? I'd like for you both to comment on that, Kate. Sure. I think that it's, it is important that the United States has a multifaceted conversation with African countries and uh, certain uh, circumstances uh, where human rights uh, are um, in very troubling on the continent uh, in, in different areas. You know, that has to be part of the conversation, part of the dialogue. You know, I think that um, it's, uh, it's challenging sometimes to satisfy everybody who wants to see you know, their issue as the headline issue or versus uh, another one. You know, I, um, I suspect that the human rights conversations are going to be had. Uh, they may not be the ones that uh, get uh, the top billing by the 
you know, government officials, but uh, in, in order to have those exchanges and those back and forth, it has to come in the context of a relationship. And so I see this as a positive step in, in building the overall relationship that allows for a more productive exchange on the human rights issues and concerns that are fundamentally important to resolve if we're talking about uh, improving security uh, and advancing democracy and development on the continent. And Amadou, I'm just about out of time, but I wanted to let you comment on that as well very quickly. Yes, sure. First of all, I, I mean, it's a very good thing that for the summit, you have different stakeholders. It's not just about the U.S. The leaders. You have civil society organization, you have the youth, uh, you have the media, and you have both U.S. and um, uh, African uh, stakeholders. And I think that will be very difficult to muzzle all these voices. Now, on the business side, it's a good business case um, to do business with countries with good governance, because else you know, you might have a short-term uh, gain, but in long term, it's very risky if you, these governments do not respect um, human rights. Fantastic conversation from both of you. I'm looking forward to this summit. I'm sure that um, our viewers are as well. Kate Olmquist and Amadou Sai, thank you for the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me.